we put the schedule together, we thought that it might be nice to start by talking about open cultural democracy, which is a term I think is increasingly important for all of us if we think of ourselves as thought leaders. And I think of all of you as thought leaders or potential thought leaders. I think it's a really important to begin to recognize that the work that we do and the kinds of contributions that we make, whether they're technical, humanities-based, historical, critical in one way or another, are create, we're creating culture and recreating culture. And it's important in various ways for those creations to take their place in a, in a system, in a system in which people can share that information, in which people can hear your ideas and build off of those ideas. The second idea I'm going to propose is that what threatens that idea of cultural democracy is a property rights framework that our cultural endeavors have fallen into. And then third, I think that there are, there are some tools that have contained cultural endeavors, but there are also some tools that are seeking to open it up. Right up against the idea that we share certain goods. We share the streets, for example. We share parks. There are a lot of things that we as a collective want to invest in. Culture is one of those things. Culture used to be confined to notions of high art and so forth, but now I think we, we concede and, and recognize that culture is all, is, culture's all around. Culture is the way we live our lives. Culture, it's a bit more than habits, but it's a set of preconditions and it's a set of predispositions that we bring to a variety of endeavors, to a variety of settings. One of the problems facing culture and maintaining a vital culture is that democracy, with its focus on the individual and its focus on self-determination, has evolved in our westernized societies to use property law and property rights as a framework for kind of validating you, for validating what's yours, for validating your effort, for validating what you do. You get some rights to what it is you do. If you write a book and you own that book, are you really happy with that book if you're the only one who reads it? Probably not. You probably wrote that book because you'd like to share it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so too, if you make a television program or a movie or you write a brilliant piece of code, you maybe want you want to get that out somehow. But yet it's yours in a certain way. This is kind of the conundrum of property in a democratic system. Uh, those broader social goals of sharing can conflict sometimes with what people might want when they have developed something. To the extent that 15 years ago, uh, this massive music sharing community that emerged with Napster and Grokster, terms perhaps from your youth, a filmmaker, Brett Gaynor, came up with when he did a wonderful little movie called uh, Rip, a Remix Manifesto. Has anybody seen that movie? It's, it's terrific. Uh, culture always builds on the past. We always look to what exists when we think about what to do next and how we can make it better, how we can modify it. Not always, but frequently. But the past controls the future. This is the problem with property rights and intellectual property right now. The companies from the past those, those extant companies are trying to control our future. The future is becoming less free, but to build the free societies we all want, to build those democracies, we somehow have to limit the control of the past. So I love the fact that he was able to summarize the whole thing in four sentences. <laughs> to what extent can I rely on old work to create new work and have somebody say, hey, that's mine? You know, what if you say, well, maybe 5% is yours, but 95% is mine. What's that line between the old and the new when we do get inspiration or maybe, you know, use a little bit of something that's already existing in order to create something new? Many of us are probably techno-optimists. How many of you would say technology solves more problems than creates? Yeah, maybe 
few opt there's a few pessimists in here. Does anybody recognize this? You recognize the doll. Yeah. This was actually an, an, an exhibit by an artist named Tom Forsyth, who had a series of photographs of food chain Barbie. Uh, and guess what? Mattel, who manufactures Barbie, didn't really like Barbie being used in this way. What do you think? Good or bad? I think they don't know how the kids use them. Otherwise, they will be as <laughs> Corporation says you're using our product. She's right there. It is. It is their product. The blender obviously isn't theirs. The configuration isn't theirs. Well, Forsyth, you know, he's not a, a rich artist, uh, but he objected. He, you know, even though Mattel said that he was infringing on their, they specifically said copyright and trademark. Uh, Forsyth wasn't making any money from this, for obvious, for probably obvious reasons. I don't know. Uh, he went to our American Civil Liberties Union, a nonprofit that gets involved in a lot of freedom of speech issues, and they defended him, and they ultimately ruled on behalf of the artist in this case. But this is a, it's you know one of many many examples of you know a cultural creation that was facing some objections from a very powerful content creator you know, Mattel with all of its toys and dolls. Another, another <laughs> example, how many of you have heard of Weird Al? Weird Al Yankovic? I have to play some of his music. You might have heard his music. Well, he, his whole persona is being weird. And he takes well-known songs and changes the words, basically. He always has sought permission, but they are not his songs very explicitly. And he, as far as I know, has never been sued, interestingly enough. Uh, probably because he's now a person of some notoriety and, and recogn maybe recognition is a better word. But what he's doing is, if, if, some, if you did it, you would be sued immediately. The only reason he gets away with it is because he is kind of a, a celebrity himself at this point. But that line between the stuff that he's, you know, use the word stealing or pirating or using for his own music, uh, for, for, for his adaptations, is one that at least hasn't been subject to any, any court threats to date. But it really does beg the question of, well, is it really yours or is it theirs? And if somebody were to sue, what would happen? In the music domain, we've had a lot of these kinds of cases where artists use existing music and retool it somehow in order to make something new. Historically, there have been a lot of technological challenges to the control over creative content as well. Um, photography, for example, presented copyright with one of the very first, uh, but not the first, challenge or control <coughs> or challenge. Print actually presented the first case of, of issues of control. But this, this ended up being kind of a famous case in which a photograph of Oscar Wilde, clearly a posed photograph, was uh, reproduced, was taken uh, from the photographer, basically, and used in another venue, a, a, a company, a lithograph company called Burrow Giles, copied it and sold it in the context of another product. Uh, the photographer, whose name was Sarah Nee, objected to that, and ultimately the court said, well, yeah, this is a work of art, and Sarah Nee's rights should be protected in this particular in this particular case. So photography was kind of swept into that the existing definitions of the types of content that would be protected, so-called protected, by copyright. And we've seen the types of content uh, get bigger and bigger and bigger over the course of copyright 
other technological means of limiting our access to certain content occurs with things like DRM, digital rights management. And certainly uh, a lot of people objected to what Apple did early on with its digital rights bottle up. A lot of, many people loved iTunes because it made it very, very easy to get access to music, to pay. You didn't have to worry about uh, viruses, seeing cheap enough, it was a buck a song. And see, it, you know, it was really met with widespread, widespread um, positive perception. But in fact, Apple's, especially their original terms, were extremely oppressive in terms of copyright and how many copies you could make of something you thought you bought. You, in fact, didn't really own a copy to do with what you wanted. Initially, Apple limited the number of copies that you could make. And this is typical, you know, atypical DRM technique. Other types of DRM techniques would be, you know, just encrypting something or putting some kind of copy protection on a computer program so that you can't break into it and modify it in some way, shape, or form. There are lots of DRM techniques out there, and it continues to be uh, a technique that a lot of content owners would like to use to control what they. I love this image because of the shackles on this. Um, in this country, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed to criminalize any attempt to <coughs> circumvent copyright protections with huge fines and even jail time associated with it. End user license agreements, my colleague Laura Stein has written a lot on end user license agreements. This is something we don't pay very much attention to. All of us know what these are. We don't read them. We click agree when we want to use some software or something that we've, that we've downloaded. But in fact, they underscore the fact that we don't own whatever it is we've just agreed to. And we don't even know the terms, uh, typically, because we don't read these end user license agreements. But licensing, from my perspective, is, well, it, well, it's extraordinarily handy. It's an exceedingly dangerous tool as well for a lot of content because it masquerades uh, ownership of certain kinds of content when you don't really, you don't really have ownership or any, any, any future distribution rights over certain categories of content. The ebook is a particular item that I've been paying a lot of attention to lately. Any of you who buy e-books, you don't own books. You've licensed those books. You do not own them. And they can disappear from your machine at, uh, almost at will. So I think I'm going to end there. I've got a lot more to say, but I, but I want to hear from Phil. Uh, and and uh, I think he's going to take some different positions. I also have later, later slides that if we get to get to them later, we can talk about open source and creative commons as well.